When you talk about the issue of sexual brokenness and how does it fit in with whether I should have love or be loved or what's love about, the most important thing to understand is that um, most of the time a sexual brokenness issue is basically a love issue. Something broke down in love because God designed us to be people who were connected at very deep levels, not only what we call vertically with Him and His Holy Spirit and the Word and His presence and in worship, but also horizontally with other safe people that care about us and connect with us at deep levels. And every time I've treated a sexual disorder, someone who was suffering and had, a, had all kinds of pain and, 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 and trouble because of some sexual problem, it never stayed with the sex. It always went down to there was a love problem. There was a disruption in their ability to either experience love or the people around them or a family of origin that didn't know how to produce love or, either, or, or horrible things where there was actually anti-love, where there was trauma, or there was abuse, where there was um, watching and witnessing horrible things. And, and what you start to notice is that God never intended that. He intended us, if you look back in Genesis, where he said, see, he said to Adam, he said, I want you to subdue and rule this world. Then he put Adam and Eve together and put them in relationship. The intent was always to be a loved person. So many of the sexually broken people that I've treated and counseled have kind of given up on love. They just thought, you know, that train left. <laughs> I don't have that training anymore. Maybe I'll find a good job or maybe I'll have a couple of friends or I'll go to church or, or whatever. But the good news about this is that they can be restored back to what God designed back in the garden, which was a state of vertical love and horizontal love where you really feel safe and you really feel known and there is no condemnation. A lot of people ask the question, how in the world, you know, I, I feel so much um, like a... Uh, I'm damaged goods. I feel like um, I don't qualify for love. I'm not a lovable person. And the big question, especially among people who have sexual hurts, is how can I change from being a, a sexually, or not even sexually, just a basically unlovable person to someone who is lovable? Well, let me tell you what first what people try to do. They try to think their way into that. You know, they try to think, gosh, I'm lovable. And they get a three by five card and they put it on their mirror every morning when they're shaving or whatever they're doing. And say, I'm lovable, I'm lovable. And certainly that can help. But the problem is that's sort of like saying, I'm going to download a bunch of iTunes and listen to those songs, but gosh, my computer's broken. <laughs> your computer is your soul and your mind. And if your soul and your mind are broken, you can say those things all day and they won't change it because it's not a software issue, it's a hardware issue. Something in us is broken that doesn't allow us to feel, feel lovable. So what I work with when I'm working with someone who's broken is we talk about how they can begin to experience love. It's not the knowledge in our heads of being loved. It's that 18 inches between the head and the heart and how do I experience love. And what it means, it's a little scary really, is because we have to take them through a process where they basically go into a period of confession. You know, James, James says in chapter 5, if you confess your lacks and sins and all this, that you'll be healed. They have to confess how unlovable they feel, and they have to take a risk and find some safe people, very, very safe people who have no judgment in their hearts and no criticism, and say, here's, here's how I feel. I feel like I'm dirt. I feel like I, I don't qualify. I feel like God's got me on the bench the rest of my life. I feel like I am on the bottom shelf. And there's often great pain with this and great shame with this and great guilt and, and just lots of tears and lots of hurt because this is how they really, this is their reality inside. This, I mean, you don't talk someone out of these feelings. This is really how they feel and it's got to come out. But what happens when it comes out is then someone says, I see all that and I see what's happened to you and I'm for you. And when someone says, I'm for you, what they're saying is, I give you grace, because that's what grace is. When, if, when you look in the theological definition of grace, it's just two words, un, unmerited favor. I'm, like God says, I, I, you know, I, I love you and you don't deserve it, and I'm giving you favor. And what I use when I, use, when I talk to people who are dealing with sexual issues is, let's talk about the fact that uh, you don't have anybody for you. And so when I confess all the bad stuff and someone says, I get it and I'm for you, great things happen. I'll give you an example of this. I was working um, in a group of uh, people struggling with various issues, some sexual, some relational, uh, some depression, and this sort of thing. And um, there was a guy who said, um, I don't deserve to be here because I'm still acting out. 
And I said, well, what have you done? He said, well, I've been the last two or three months pretending like I had it together and kind of rah-rah and, you know, go God and all this. And, but I've been lying and I've been compartmentalizing and I've been acting out like crazy and I've just been afraid to tell you guys. So I guess I, guess I need to leave now. I guess I've, I've been kicked out. And I said, hold on. So, hold on. I said, so you really think that because you've been lying about this that, you know, you shouldn't be part of us? And he goes, yeah, I mean, because you guys are talking about us being honest and opening up and all this. And I said, well, why don't you do a favor for me and for the group? Why don't you talk about how you feel about yourself right now? And then I want you to look around and look at the group and see what they're feeling towards you. And he says, well, I'm, I'm a loser. I've lost it. I've let you guys down. I've been, you know, acting out. I've been lying about it. And uh, you guys are like good people. And I'm not, I don't deserve to be with you. And you could see this cloud of shame, which is, you know, negates all love. Nobody feels loved when they feel shame. You could see the cloud of shame. And his head's down. And I said, look around the room. And, and this totally kind of gets me emotionally. He, he looks around the room, and people's eyes were full of tears. And they were leaning toward him. And I said to the group, tell, tell Sam what you're thinking and feeling towards him right now. And one person said, I... I so feel bad for you, how much pain you're in. I, I want to be your friend. And somebody else said, M did we not make it safe enough for you to open up? Is that, is that why you've hidden it for so long? Because I don't want you to ever feel that again. I want you to feel okay with, even when you're acting out. Another person said, I want to pray with you right now. I want to be your friend and I want to be, bring God into this because I can tell how much you're hurting. Another person said, I don't want you to leave because we need you here. And I'm so glad because I feel like I know you at a deeper level. The fact that you admitted this makes it safe for me to be myself. So I totally want you here. And another person said, me too. I've been doing this too. He said, I, uh, I've been lying too. And I wasn't safe enough to say anything. And you're ahead of me. But I've, I've been acting out and not talking about it. And it was one of those sacred moments that you don't see very much where you could see the body of Christ moving toward a guy who was utterly, utterly unloved, utterly, utterly unlovable, and they broke into him and said, we're on you. We know the bad stuff. We know as deep as it gets. We know all the shame you're feeling, and we are still for you. And he broke, and he just kind of fell apart sobbing, and we all kind of did because that was a God moment where he got the nature of love and grace. And now he's a different man. I mean, he's got a normal life and he's in ministries and all this sort of thing. He's in business. But my point was, when you, when we, we, you first start talking about how do you let somebody who's unlovable feel lovable, you don't just tell them all day and you don't tell them yourself. You've got to have it happen in experience. That's where it gets to the heart. Honesty and love are kind of the two big healing elements of any sexual brokenness. You know, people can try harder all day, and they can use willpower all day, and they can pretend to feel things they don't, but at the heart of it, God heals people through honesty and love. And Psalm 85 describes God's character. It says, in God, it says, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and peace have connected their friends. They've kissed each other. And I think that's so powerful because in God, His righteousness, which is honesty, you know, truthfulness, honesty, confrontation, reality, and, and peace, which is love and understanding and compassion and connection, they're buddies and they work together. But in us, especially in a sexually broken person, honesty and, pe honesty and love fight each other. A person, especially with the shame issues of a sexually broken person, what they feel is not that they're friends, but they're, they're enemies. If I'm honest, you're going to hate me, and you're going to condemn me, and you're going to say I'm dirt, and you'll never see me again, and you'll divorce me, or you'll fire me, or I'll never have friends, or you'll kick me out of my church. So honesty isn't good. So I won't, I won't be honest. So then they try the love only thing, and they love without being honest, and they connect without being honest. You know what they do? Then they lose themselves because you can never say how you really feel. And in the dark kind of compartments and recesses of your heart, you can't say, here's how hard it is. I'm, I'm acting out again. I can't stop. It's out of control. You can't talk about the darkness. You can't talk about the scary stuff. So 
So people with sexual brokenness are always stuck in like two channels in their head. Either I'm honest and I lose everybody, or I have people, but they don't really know me because I can't be myself. So they aren't two good channels. So God's solution to this, um, I think, is kind of a, step, a stepwise thing. First off, we've got to be willing to be honest. And that can't happen. I don't think it's possible to happen until we know we're in a safe environment. I think the first thing we've got to do is find a place that's very much like the character of God, like that group I, I discussed earlier in, the, in an earlier question. We've got to find a setting where there's a mentor or a counselor or a, a bunch of co-addicts that are admitting the truth and have no condemnation or a small group. There's got to be a setting where being screwed up is normal, <laughs> really, and being perfect is not normal. <laughs> And so all the perfect people can go sit out in their car and wait till the meeting's over because we don't need you. <laughs> but, but where having struggle and hurting and making mistakes is normal. That's the way the body of Christ should work. And so when there's zero condemnation and there's zero judgment and there's total safety, then we can be honest. And what I found then is that in a safe environment, God created us that we want to come out. You know, we, we want to we admit who we are. I mean, you, you look at the Bible, and like it says in Proverbs chapter 20, it says that the, the wells of a man's heart are very deep, and a man of understanding draws him out. That's that, that honest part that says, I acted out because I was lonely, or that says, I used because um, I felt powerless, or I acted out because I felt like nobody liked me, or I felt like, um, uh, I felt like uh, I'm a failure, and so I anesthetized myself by acting out, because so much of sexual brokenness is just anesthetizing emotional pain and character pain and brokenness and family of origin stuff. It's just a way to medicate it so we can survive. And, to, and, and so a man of understanding draws that out. So the truth comes out. We want to come out. It's like we have this bubble of truth inside us that we're saying, somebody know me. I'm dying here. I'm tired of pretending. I'm tired of using. I'm tired of acting out. I, I want somebody to know me, but I'm not going to do it till it's safe. So the safety comes, and that bubble just kind of comes out because we're designed to be in confession. In Ephesians, it says, live as children of the light. We're designed to live in the light. And so we're crying and screaming, I want somebody to know how it feels to be me. I want somebody to know how, how crazy it is and how scary it is and how dark it is. And then once we're in the safe environment, we take a big risk and we go, okay, I'm going to tell you. And there's the honesty part. And then a miracle happens. And I think the miracle is that then grace and love come to that part that we're honest about and say, we can handle this and we'll transform it. And all that pain and all that the misunderstanding and all of the hurts and all the, the abuse from the past begins to be forgiven and grieved over and healed and restored. The Bible talks about redemption. All that stuff begins, begins to get redeemed and a person begins to live in love. So you've got to get safety. Then you got to be honest and take the big risk, the big, you know, jump out of the boat, Peter, and tell somebody who you are and give them a chance to reject you because there's no way to do it if you don't give them that chance. And then when they don't reject you and they're for you, then you feel love. And once you feel love and you feel like that bad part of you, that broken part of you, that shameful part of you is loved, you're going to heal. And I've seen so many people, once they've had that experience, they never went back because they didn't need it. Grace is one of the indispensable pillars of recovery, healing, growth. The Bible calls it sanctification, changing from one person to another. And it's not a luxury. It's like it's a necessity. It's a foundation. And the reason I say that is because grace is, is the fuel for life. If, if, if you look at your life like you're a car and you're driving down the road, you've got to have a thing called gasoline. And if you don't have gasoline, your car doesn't run. Well, that's what grace is. It's, it's basically our gasoline. And it's God's way of filling us up. And we get it from Him and His Spirit and His Word and prayer and surrender and worship. And we also get it from other people. In 1 Peter, for example, chapter 4, verse 1, very, very powerful verse that I use a lot of times with people who are sexually broken. And they kind of go, really? Because they've never heard this. It says, we are the stewards of His manifold grace. We, people, you know, lumpy, bumpy, cellulite-filled people, you know, we are the stewards of His grace. That, that a lot of times a sexually broken person will feel safe with God because He doesn't condemn them or he can't, they can't see them. But their big risk for them is, you mean, I've got to tell somebody with skin on about this? 
Yeah, you got to tell God and somebody with skin on, Jesus with skin on, because that passage means that people are just one of the main delivery systems of grace. If you want it from God, you got it, you can get it. But the person, especially if people with sexual issues, if you're just getting it from God, the Bible says that's not enough. You're, you're not completely getting all the grace you need. We are the stewards of His grace. So, we get it this way, and we get it this way, like I mentioned earlier. And I'll tell you what happens is, is it's kind of uncomfortable at first because sexually broken people, they want to fix themselves. They want to do it by more discipline, and I'll never do this again, and I'll be accountable, and I'll beat myself up with, you know, a shame stick, and, you know, the whole shame cycle that the research says. Um, I think you had Dr. Henslin on, or you will have him on. He's really good on the shame cycle. Um, he's a colleague. But that's basically willpower. And willpower never saved anybody. It never transformed anybody. It never fixed a sexually broken person. Willpower is nice if you want to lose five pounds or if you want to like not eat another pizza or whatever, but when you've got brokenness, willpower won't do it. If, if willpower did it, then the Bible would have stopped at Exodus 20 because the Ten Commandments would have been there and he'd have said, Moses said, okay, there's the big ten, go do those, have a nice life, and we'd be doing that. But the other, what, two-thirds of the Bible is about how we can't do that. Why? Because we are broken and we need grace. And grace is when we say, and this is, what, this is very hard for a sexually broken person to say, but they must say it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't stop. I can't use my New Year's resolutions. I can't beat myself up. I can't try harder. I can't distract myself. I can't, you know, batten down the hatches. I can't. And now there's this gap between my willpower and then God. And God's waiting on the other side of my willpower and says, You ready? I know you can't. It's not always a want, and I hate it. I mean, I, I, I work with sexual, sexually broken people so much, I hate it when they've heard other counselors and other people tell them, well, you just, you just want to stay sick, or you're just, choosing, you're just choosing to, like, you know, act out. They don't understand the Bible, and they don't understand human behavior. It's not a want to, and it's not a choose to. It's, I can't. Romans chapter 7, the things that I want to do, I, I can't do, and the things that I don't want to do, I can't stop. And then he moves to Romans 8. God gives us grace. There is now no condemnation. So God's waiting there in that gap that says, you ready for grace? But here's our problem, especially with sexual brokenness. We're not comfortable with that because then we've got to say, I've got to trust, and I've got to be needy, and I've got to be dependent, and I've got to ask, and I've got to receive, and I've got to be humble, and that is so hard. And here's why, because psychologically speaking, most sexually broken people have been really wounded by some other relationship. They've been hurt, they've been controlled, they've been objectified, they've been traumatized, they've been abused. And so the whole idea of reaching out for grace sends up a lot of trigger responses we call in psychology. It, it triggers them, it, it puts them into a panic state, they get phobic, it's sort of like, don't make me reach out again. I've survived the last 23 years by not reaching out and working on willpower. You're telling me the only way to get well is to trust and ask, not just God, but people? Yes. Now, we're not going to give you the same people you had the first time when you were 5 or 13. But that's what grace is, is saying, I need, I can't do it, I need help, I need you to care about me, and then miracles happen. But that's the big problem, is giving up willpower and moving to grace. But it's the only solution that God gave us. And it's the only one that really works to really transform us. Here we are on Christian TV. So we're talking about God, right? But we're also talking about sexual brokenness. When people go, how do you do that? Well, it's really important to do that because God gave us sex. And, and yet... Many people who have had, who've been wounded sexually, they really don't like God. <laughs> and they're really mad at Him, and they think that He let them down, and we're talking about trusting Him and opening up to Him. And I just finished a book that's uh, coming out pretty soon called Where is God? Kind of a hard times book, where I talk about what He's really doing when we have a brokenness. Anything from a financial issue and the downturn to a job problem to a sexual problem to a relational problem to an emotional problem, where is God? And there's a chapter in the book, early in the book, where I talk about, there's a, the, the title of the chapter is, The God That You, you Should Not Trust. <laughs> there is a God you should not trust. 
And that is a God uh, basically made up of our distortions of who He is. Because a lot of times we form God not the way He is, but the way we've been related to. You know, in the Psalms it says, David talks about his own childhood, and he says, you taught me how to trust in you at my mother's breast. And what he's saying there is, infants learn about the eternal God, the eternal Father from their parents, from mom and dad. You know, the, the safety of the mom shows an infant, one day you're gonna be relating to a God who's safe. The warmth of the mother and her care and love show the child, okay, this is good for me, and one day you're gonna put me in the arms of someone who's eternal, who has those characteristics. So we learn about the invisible from the visible. We learn about the, uh, the eternal from the temporal. We learn about God from people. So most people have this God in their head that's not really God at all. The God that allowed me to be abused and sat by and did nothing, didn't care. Or the God that even, the God that even brought this bad person to my life who used me and they took that initiative. Why would God put that person in my life? Or the guy that didn't rescue me from my pain or the guy that, the God that uh, condemns me allows me to feel shame. Well, in that chapter, the God that you should not trust, what I, what I point out is um, you got to pay attention to those distortions. If we're mad at God, first we've got to understand that people in the Bible felt the same way. You know, David, go, go through the Psalms in David, like around the 70s and 80s, and he's so bugged with God. He says, hey, I'm living in a cave, and I should be king, and Saul's trying to kill me, or everybody's like sticking knives in me, or, you know, he's really saying, where are you? And we call it that protest. In psychology, that's called protest. It's like, I hate what's going on, and I don't know about you. Well, but if you look at what David does, it's kind of funny. Every one of those Psalms, except for one, number 88, but all the rest of them, he, he has this, he's mad at God and he's bugged. And at the end of the psalm, he says, but I see that you're good. And I see that you're gonna take care of me. And I see that you're righteous and you're gonna be, you're gonna be safe with me. And what you see is that as David gave full vent to his feelings to God, which every sexually broken people person should do, don't be afraid of how negative you feel towards God, because God can handle it. And as David did that, then you see, gosh, God didn't hit me with a lightning bolt. God listened. God understood, God empathized, God's not mad. God didn't say, well, look at all I've done for you, you ungrateful wretch. Why don't you praise me? God just was caring. And you see David's protest turn into praise. Well, I think that's what every person who struggles with the whole God picture in their sexual brokenness should do is say, I need to be really honest with God. I think he let me down. I think he let stuff happen that he shouldn't have let happen and do what David did and read the Psalms and say, I feel what he felt. But that's not all. This, the next step to that is to begin to study who God is. And that's why I think the Bible is so important because the Bible really tells us who He is. And, and to study His characteristics and to study His righteousness and His praise and study His love for us and study who He is. And you begin to see, you know, I had this God in my head that's sort of a patchwork quilt of crazy people and evil people in my life. He's not like that.